So thank you again to Peter and Tigran and all the people who made this possible. Um, I'm going to go as quickly as I can, um, following actually a number of talks that really have set this up for me. And I really want to just make three points. The first, as I think has been demonstrated already, there has been a decline in publicness and accessibility to public space in the United States and Latin America, I also work in Latin America, that is due to what I'm calling illiberal urbanism. Two. What does this mean? This change necessitates that we have a robust, multi-level social justice framework for planning, design, and the evaluation of public space. And we've seen some examples, and I guess I'm talking to those of you here and those of you who teach planners and designers and architects. And since I'm a researcher, it also means that it requires new methods that can be used by communities and researchers and activists to record these injustices and exclusion, and I'm going to um, just let you know a little bit about our tool cut, toolkit for the ethnographic study of space. So I want to start with Hudson Yards. Um, Hudson Yards offers 14 acres of public space to the la last undeveloped parcel of land in Manhattan. And this is what it offers you as public space, the vessel, as well as you well know, and that this vessel, which is Tom Heatherwick's um, folly, which I hear in the UK, everybody knows that they don't like his sculpture, um, also creates uh, a, a situation in which this is a choice Simpson who is sitting right there as my graduate students. Research is demonstrating here, these are all the people who are going to check that uh, before you go into the vessel and that you have given away your rights to any photograph um, or any media or anything that you might do while if, with regard to the vessel. And they do not need to tell you what they are going to do with this data or this information. Um, and they are saying that they may use it differently than they're currently using it. Um, but not only is it a very restricted public space, I mean, most of those 14 uh, acres of Hudson Yards is either a driveway for the the mall that is there, a very expensive mall. Um, it is also dotted with this new what's called content management system, which they have not specified. And it is really less known that these 30 kiosks that dot the landscape also have two small hidden cameras that they say are to record your affective response when you're looking at the ads. I'm saying this for Nan. And that they track the atmosphere. On the other hand, as the president of Related, that's the developer of this site says, the data is our data for the purposes of allowing us to make Hudson Yards function better. Don, there's one of your examples, i.e. to make more money, rent. And here's Toy's, uh, Troy's slide, though, just to bring it down to home. And this is one of the few areas that is open to walk on. It's a gravel area. And you will all see that you aren't allowed to walk on the gravel that is there in the first place. And, and Troy was trying to explain to me, Troy, right, that this cement little path there is where you're allowed to walk. You can't even walk on the gravel. I wanted to time. All right, so a second example, the Apple Store in Grand Central Station. Um, I'm calling this public, private, ambivalent space, this whole idea of ambipower, but what's public, what's private, what's visible, what's invisible, who can be called, when can they be called. And again, I have a graduate student, Manu um, Akika Savan, and she's been doing some interviewing there for me, and she was asking the manager, well, are the stairs part of the store? Mind you, they were built uh, back when the bid took over Grand Central Station and it is part of the store, and she goes, how far does it extend? And the manager says, yeah, it's still Apple, but not really, and then goes on to explain how it's really public space, but is it Apple's, is it whatever. Then she goes, well, what do you mean by Q? She says, but we know how to manage it. And she says, well, what do you mean by key manage, Q management? She says, well, we have ways to organize people. Like I said, we have greeters and all that stuff. And again, a whole long, wonderful interview about all the ways that they manipulate and manage the space. And and finally, because there's this blaring sound when you're in there saying that no one can sit on the floor, no one can sit on the floor, she's saying, I've seen people sit on the floor, are you okay with that too? And the manager 
goes, hmm, well, MTA has a policy about people sitting. It's like we take partnership with whatever the MTA says. But in fact, what goes on, as you can see this young woman is sitting, it depends who's sitting on the floor. It depends on whether they decide that space is public-private. It depends when they call in the MTA or whether they use their greeters, their security guards, their imaginary cue control to make sure that this space is working in a way unlike any public space. And what I'm trying to say very quickly is that I think this is different. I don't think this is just the same old neoliberalism. And uh, I don't have the right terms for it. It's up to you to help me on that. Um, some of us are calling it illiberal urbanism, which is really focusing on the illegality of it, on the domination and corruption that is underlying the kind of neoliberalism that we're seeing. Um, my friend Sally Mary calls it post-collective, in which the collective, the, the, the other is expanding and the we is contracting. Um, uh, those of you who know Mariana Pandolfi, um, she calls it post-liberal, uh, the multiplication of mechanisms for controlling human life. And again, Don, I think that these are all mechanisms. And the term um, that some of us are using, or at least that we feel characterizes the world that we're now living, is the post-political. And I'm not going to spend much time, but um, these are our public spaces, when you think about it in terms of public space, so that autocratic governance, I think that's pretty clear, but when you try to begin to thinking about the economization of politics, th think about the kinds of issues of what Dawn was just talking about, or the depoliticization of the economy. Think about the term, those of you who know, laissez-faire racism. That means if you can't pay for it, it keeps certain people of color out. Um, these are the kinds of things. So these are techno-managerial consensus decisions with no, quote, policy politics behind them, and a permanent state of emergency in which uh, the homeless or someone or something, or terrorists or something to be afraid of, and a whole group, new group of on unauthorized actors. On the other hand, just to say we're in a post-political moment um, doesn't mean that there isn't resistance and contestation of space. This is Tompkins Park today, where we're also working, doing research, um, and there are signs of resistance. And in fact, um, part of why I'm talking today is, as my third point is, I think we have to join in that resistance. I don't think we can be passive academics and planners. So what is at stake here is the practice of real democracy, the public space for the encounter and negotiation of disagreement, for inaugurating a new sense and uh, sensibility where those who have no place and are not counted or named acquire speech or better appropriate voice and become visible and perceptible and perform the egalitarian capacity to govern. And we are now creating places where that is no longer happening. So what do we do? Okay, so here's the middle part. Um, I'm suggesting, as I have before, but I keep modifying, I've been working on this, some of you know, what, three, four years now, uh, uh, trying to work out a better way, um, to, uh, a better normative stance, a better way to talk about the kinds of things that I was working on when I was talking about diversity, which is a social justice framework or social justice in public space framework that really draws upon a very wide and robust, multi-level uh, understanding of justice. And I'm not going to read it over to you because I think you can see it right there. Um, and what I like about this framework and I think what is necessary, and because I know I mentioned this to you, I've also been working on a multi-dimensional definition of public space, not unlike what Vikas is doing and that I'm imagining these dimensions as being possible, but thinking about the physical, the ownership, the governance authority, but not just the governance authority, the forms of control and influences, rules and regulations, access. I, the cultural anthropologist, have the symbolic meanings and historic meanings, how much political activity can or does occur in the space, and what I'm calling civil society, maybe the wrong term, is I've always been interested in these public spaces where you could meet others that you would not, would not necessarily meet which
which I think we've let drop out of our, just our area. These are places, again, in Latin America where people come together and talk and meet, be it the Corso or be it the Retreta or be it a, a Highline or whatever. Okay, and what I like about this framework is that it does address multiple levels of analysis and political scale. I'll try to very briefly demonstrate it. I like that it has a more robust definition, though you could certainly work with me on making it better, that has ownership and governance in it, as well as the control, as well as the physical attributes. It is a normative stance, a la Susan Feinstein's Just City. I mean, she's certainly influenced me, but what I didn't like is for her it was just distributive justice and it doesn't work for the public spaces I look at. It's too narrow a frame. It, I think, offers a community-based and empirical approach uh, for identifying and understanding injustice. I think uh, you can use this empirically, and it's based on all of you sitting here. I have many of your names up here. I'm tr I have read all of you, and I really realize that I'm drawing little bits from everyone here and there, plus, again, my own 30 years of ethnographic research, both with myself, my colleagues, and my students. So, um, I'm 13 minutes in, about? Okay. Um, I'm, going to, I'm going to do this very quickly because I do want to get to the end. Um, I'm not going to even talk. You can read what I have here, but let me just frame the questions and show you what I mean. How can public space be distributed fairly? What does it look like, but both at a citywide and site-specific level? I don't need to say much. It's the Bronx, it's Manhattan, it's Central Park, and a playground. Distributive justice site-specific. But I want us to be also at the same moment thinking about um, distributive justice citywide. So up here we have ambulatory vendors in Buenos Aires who um, use the speed, streets as a place to work and the streets are being taken away from them, as are their livelihoods, and they make up 60% of the workers in Buenos Aires. And down here we have Yangon, where these women who run these restaurants and support their families are pushed off by the police at irregular and irregular. So at both levels. Procedural justice. How do we ensure that, that the allocation of space is fair and that communities are involved in its allocation and decisions? Um, I don't have time, but do you all know the story of San Francisco in the Mission District where the soccer field uh, where kids have been playing, what, for forever, for generations, playing soccer and the guys with these Dropbox t-shirts of the, the tech company come in and they said, oh, we paid $27 to use this field. You can't use it anymore. And uh, the video went viral and it ultimately got overturned. But here we have a great case of public space being turned into rent um, and um, what that's going to mean. So that's site specific procedural justice. But there's even citywide in San Francisco. Again, I'm just going to refer to Google, Google buses, uh, taking tech tech company buses taking over the city streets, not paying anything but a dollar as a contribution back to the city. And this actually is taken from uh, an uh, uprising in which um, the, the social movement took all the uh, uh, how do you call it? scooters that were being used by a tech company and they were storing them on the sidewalks so no one could use the sidewalks. So a total privatization in an indirect sense. Interactional justice, and this is where I think I'm making a little more of an original contribution. We do know about procedural and distributive justice, but interactional justice has to do with some of the soft stuff that the cultural anthropologist is interested, uh, which, how do we guarantee that communications and decision making are truthful and adequate? How do we create a social environment of respect and dignity for all. And maybe it shouldn't be the we, but I feel like we're here as a group and these are all of our concerns. Um, 
interpersonal justice. This is Costa Rica. These are Nicaraguans who in Costa Rica are being harassed by the police. This is their social center where they go every Sunday. Um, they are not being treated with respect. And um, this are Latino workers in my neighborhood um, who stand on the sidewalks and that the police constantly harass and push off the sidewalk even though it's public space and they again cannot make a living. But citywide, um, racial profiling, um, these are students at NYU protesting, uh, requires dignity. And I think our examples in the US, I keep it now to the US, but you also find it in Latin America, that it's a citywide uh, kind of interpersonal uh, thing. But there's also informational injustice, something I've not mentioned in my previous work. And that's when certain groups don't get information, um, don't really learn about what's going on. And here is the case of the snow fences being put up in Prospect Park to protect an ecological um, reconstruction. And uh, African Americans in that park said that they were to keep uh, blacks out of the white side of the park. Because for those of you who know Prospect Park in Brooklyn, one part is Park Slope, which is white and Latino, and on the other side it tends to be Caribbean American. Though those are stereotypes at this point. Um, and um, basically there wasn't interpretation. And if you wonder about this picture, this is Lafayette and his horse, both of whom are named in this picture. However, the African American holding the horse is, there is no name on the plaque as you enter Prospect Park. Uh, informational justice also at a citywide level when in a city like New York, it tells you you're not allowed to eat and you can be hauled off by the police and it's only in English. Ethic of care and repair. How do we promote pro-social behavior and care of others? New, new question, add it to our justice. Uh, comes from, I'll say right now, from my students who were in Occupy. I think Don knows that, right? From Manissa. Uh, and then another graduate student. That This is a place, um, Joan Toronto talks about, that once we're in a democratic society that makes a commitment to people, then we've made a commitment to care for them as well. And if you are, in, you know, so then what are we doing to encourage the repair of the environment and the care and not to disrupt the care and repair relationship relationships that are already in place. Again, this is Costa Rica, small acts of kindness, be them organized or unorganized. As you'll note, this man is sleeping and everybody's giving him space and making sure he's okay instead of asking him to move. Um, this is at the citywide level. Again, these are all bimodal, trying to think about care at a citywide level. Uh, Don, I don't know if you were at the Free University after Occupy that was organized by the students at CUNY, um, but it means creating, and this is of course the cleanup uh, of the beach after, uh, after Sandy in the Rockaways, in which volunteers were building a thing. So that, that we can think about this at a citywide scale. And finally, and maybe most importantly, um, how do we expand our norms of behavior to accommodate the diversity of behaviors and users of public space? I think this underlies almost everything we've heard today, and the only reason I raise my hand a few times, right, so, is that the recognition of difference, of course, I'm going to get a phone call right now, um, is, is, is critical. At any rate, I don't have time. This is uh, two young men sparring at Brooklyn Bridge Park. Uh, they were hauled off by the police for fighting, which they were not. This is not recognition of difference in skills. And the bottom actually is a great example, which is Jones Beach, where people really do feel if you're brown or black that you're accepted and there are other people like yourselves. And citywide, um, my usual slide from Lewinsky Park, Lewinsky Park in Tel Aviv, these are the Sudanese immigrants who live in the park because they're not allowed a home. Their wives are housed, but they're not allowed to work, and they're not allowed to live, and they're not allowed citizenship. So this is, but there they are, and they use the park, and they live in the park. And at the bottom is a cartonero. He's from Chile. The cartoneros pick up the trash. Um, they are losing the open spaces both where they collect the trash and where they come together. Okay, so I think there's one more piece of the puzzle. This is my framework. I, hope, I know I've gone fast, but I'm also a researcher. So what is the responsibility of the researcher? And Michelle Fine, I think, has written something that I really find profoundly useful. 
And she says, and I think it's important for all of us, that expertise is widely distributed, but wisdom about injustice is cultivated in the bodies and communities of those most intimately wounded by unjust conditions. Research on oppression must be linked to research on accumulation of privilege. And that's where my work on gated communities goes. That's why I've been telling Don, if, he asks, if you ask me the right question, I know who to go to to ask about the privilege part. I, I'm ready. Research on history, structures, and lives is powerfully produced, powerfully produces contact zones, which is what we're doing right here, how we can come together and have divergent standards points and argue about it. And research that is most valuable and of use is when it's designed alongside social justice movements, circulated by newspapers, lawsuits, media, and engagement with community life. And I think it's part of my responsibility and those of you who are researchers with me to do that. And the first step in this, and um, I will stop. I'm done. I know I'm... I'm I'm one minute over time, but here we are. Um, Troy Simpson, uh, Suzanne Scheld. Some of you know Suzanne's work with me on rethinking urban parks. And I have put together a test, a toolkit for the ethnographic a study of space. It's 10 pages. It's intended to give community members graduate students, if they want, uh, any kind of researcher, but activists and uh, public space groups, a really simple way, tool, to go into their communities and be able to identify injustice um, and the kinds of looking for things that you would not normally find in your questionnaires or in some of our behavioral mapping. And it's a step-by-step um, one page each of the kinds of methods we use and how to analyze it and write reports. So I think that as researchers, uh, we can also, I think at one level, I'm sort of saying, I think we need to be more articulate about uh, our agenda, more normative that social justice needs to frame or just sustainability, I think, if we're, uh, Julian's going to follow me, it could be well be just sustainabilities, um, that we need to be more articulate, this is where we're going, and this is what we can do as professionals to influence other professionals and government agencies that we work with, but I'm also suggesting at another level that we can work to empower the communities that we are um, working with and the communities that need what we have to offer the tools we have in a way that they can use them. Thank you so much.